Jerry Sandusky's guilt was resolved without question years ago. It's done. There's nothing more to talk about. We may have a different take on it tonight, and I'm going to have this gentleman make the case. His name's John Ziegler. I think he is a man that will, if you keep an open mind, which I recommend with anything, will challenge everything you think you know about Jerry Sandusky and the case that landed him in prison, the same prison cell he sits in right now as we sit here talking. This man doesn't think that Jerry Sandusky is innocent. He doesn't have a theory that could open a door of potential innocence. He says he's positive that Jerry Sandusky is innocent, 100% positive. So John Ziegler is fresh off a flight from Los Angeles this morning. He is the host of the new With the Benefit of Hindsight, one of my favorite podcasts in recent memory, senior columnist at Mediate. Happy to have you, John. Welcome to the Spiro Avenue Show. Wow. I have to say that of all the many, many interviews I have done on this topic, including on the Today Show and the Piers Morgan Show on CNN, that is by far the most interesting intro I have ever received. And I'm not 100% sure where you were going with that because I'm an Oxum's Razor guy, too. And I would like to address a couple of things in your intro real quick. Go ahead. Uh, because cause I think that would lend important context for where I'm coming from here and where we're going during this, I'm sure, will be very interesting and extensive interview. I would suggest that the Oxum's Razor people should look at the Penn State Sandusky case. And let's be clear. The only real reason why we care about Jerry Sandusky is because it destroyed the legacy of Joe Paterno, and it also landed uh, three Penn State administrators in deep legal hot water, two of which were convicted of misdemeanors, went to prison, one of which, the former president of Penn State, Graham Spanier, is still fighting a misdemeanor conviction and may end up very likely going to prison very soon for something he had absolutely nothing to do with, even if it happened. But I would suggest if you look at Oxum's Razor, or use Oxum's Razor to look at the entire Penn State situation. Oxum's Razor is on my side because what you are supposed to believe, here's what you're supposed to believe, and this is what the news media bought in three days back in November of 2011. In three days, we bought this idea that Jerry Sandusky, famous defensive coordinator, revered local legend who was beloved by the community, not just for his football coaching, but because he ran this massive, incredibly successful charity, The Second Mile, had actually been systematically abusing effectively teenage post-pubescent boys who were all heterosexual, we now know, for about 40 years. And he was getting away with this without any concerns whatsoever. And he was enabled in doing this by a, a, a football program that was thought of to be the most pristine of all college football programs, headed by a guy, Joe Paterno, who by every measure was the most character-driven top football coach of his era. There's no question that, that was his reputation before this, including the Penn State administrators I just referenced. They were in the same boat as far as their reputation. So... I, if Oxum's razor is used in this case, it the media's version of this fails immediately because we're supposed to believe that there was this massive cover-up for no apparent reason, including after Jerry Sandusky is no longer a coach at Penn State. And we're also supposed to believe that at times Jerry Sandusky is a criminal mastermind to the nth degree but he is also such a moron, he could not answer the question that Bob Costas famously asked him, are you sexually attracted to young boys without pausing, asking the question again, and then finally, what seemed like an eternity later, finally saying, no, I'm not sexually attracted to young boys. That makes no sense. And I'll tell you, I'll finish the Oxum's Razor uh, point on, on this uh, issue. You know, there's been many depictions of this story in the mainstream news media, all of which are garbage. But one of one of the biggest pieces of garbage is HBO's movie, which stars Al Pacino as Joe Paterno. And the Oxum's Razor analysis of that movie is hilarious and, and, and very telling because the, the narrative, the very, very short narrative of the Paterno movie on HBO is that Joe Paterno forgot 
that Jerry Sandusky was a pedophile. I think that's a pretty accurate assessment of what their narrative is. That he, when he got old, you know, he was in his almost mid eighties when this story hits. He just simply forgot that Jerry Sandusky was a pedophile, and that's their way of somehow explaining the inexplicable route that this story took uh, in order to make it make some sense. Ironically enough, I think. They were kind of in the in the in the right church. They were just in the wrong pew. I think it's what close what's closer to what happened here is Joe Paterno in his old age forgot that Jerry Sandusky was not a pedophile and in his old age was convinced that he could possibly be one by people very close to him, including his own son, Scott Paterno, including the prosecution, including Mike McQuarrie. And that is one of the many key things to what to what happened here. But one last point on, on your intro, and to understand this story, Michigan, I know Mich- you're Mich- obviously you're a Michigan State guy. I find it fascinating that a Michigan State guy has flown me all the way from Los Angeles to talk about this story when no Penn State person will. And I would like to get into why that is, because uh, it's very telling. You need to understand, to understand the rest of the story, you need to understand the perverse incentives that were created from the beginning, specifically among Penn State University and people who are fans of that university, alumni of that university, fans of Joe Paterno. Everything flips upside down. I have likened it to the North and the South Pole. Imagine if if you flipped the Earth upside down. That's basically what happened. In, in 24 hours, on November 9th, 2011, maybe it was 36 hours if you're you know being more accurate about it, but in a very short period of time, the North and South Pole of this story flips when Joe Paterno and Graham Spanier get fired. And now all of a sudden, Penn State is seen as effectively pleading guilty to everything that's been in the news the previous three days. This firestorm has exploded out of nowhere, this Jerry Sineski story. And once Penn State is seen as pleading guilty. Why, God, why would they fire the great Joe Paterno if he wasn't, if he, if, my God, not only does it mean Paterno's guilty, that means Jerry Sinusky must be guilty. In fact, he's so guilty, we don't even need to worry about the allegations against him. Instead, we're going to focus on Joe Paterno. That's the key moment in this case, is that all the focus that should have been on Jerry Sandusky instead is focused on Joe Paterno through the prism of Penn State pleading guilty in the middle of a panic, a panic. And and I think we've seen in the last year plus, people do not make good decisions, especially leadership, in the middle of a panic. And once they become invested in a narrative created by their hasty decisions in a panic, they can't go back because then they are admitting they screwed up, They were wrong, they were dumb, they were cowardly, and all the damage that ensued thereafter is on them. And so the number one thing you need to understand about this story is get it out of your minds that somehow the Penn State firing Joe Paterno is a sign that Jerry Sandusky must be guilty. In fact, it's the key to how this whole thing happened. Because no one cared about Jerry Sandusky's guilt because the Joe Paterno story was so much more interesting, especially to the news media. Joe Paterno was the star. Joe Paterno was the celebrity. Jerry Sandusky was just the vehicle to get there. And and, and that's why I was guilty of this myself. Justin, I I made a huge mistake at the beginning of this. I have no connection to Penn State for people that don't know me. I, I went to school at Georgetown. I live in, in the Los Angeles suburbs. I, I really have no allegiance whatsoever. I grew up in Pennsylvania, but I I was a Notre Dame fan growing up. Sorry, Michigan State fans. Uh, you know, and, and by the way, you didn't win the national championship in 1966. We'll talk about but, that but, later. Okay, but, uh, <laughs> the, but, but anyway, uh, my, my point is that... Um, I have no allegiance to Penn State, but I even I made the mistake of being totally distracted by the paternal angle of this story. Um, and, you know, I have criticized Scott Paterno. He and I hate each other's guts. 
Uh, and he's you know, episode three of our, our podcast with the benefit of hindsight is electric because we play a phone call between me and Scott Paterno that is just mind blowing after I interviewed Jerry Sandusky in prison, which really exposes Scott Paterno's real agenda here and how he cannot possibly admit that he was wrong in immediately coming to the conclusion, even before Joe Paterno was fired, that Jerry must be guilty, even though he had no clue. He had not a clue about the facts of the case. He didn't know any of the accusers. He didn't know Jerry. He had never had a conversation with Jerry Zaneski. I have equated Scott Paterno's strategy, since I, I, I'm pretty sure he considers himself to be a strategic genius. You know, if, if you think about this in World War II terms, and he, you know, and Scott thinks of himself as Winston Churchill, you know, there, there in London, he has a choice. Does he fight the Nazis in Europe? which would be Jerry Sandusky, or does he fight the Nazis in London, which would be Joe Paterno? <laughs> and for some reason, Scott decided, let's fight it in London. We're going to cede all of Europe immediately. We're going to give you all of Europe. We're going to put up no fight in Europe. <laughs> and Jerry is guilty. Come and get us, which was idiotic well, from a strategic I, standpoint. I, mean, I can speak for my own experience, too, and I was the biggest critic of that institution for years. I mean, half a decade before finding your work and beginning to dig into, you know, a little bit deeper. I think there's so much there. There's a lot to unpack and we'll get there. I will say just for my own personal context, my first time going to happy Valley was for a Penn state, Michigan state football game in 2010. The last game of that regular season, Michigan state won a share of the big 10 title in that game, winning that game. The perception of Paterno for my two days in that town, it's everything that you hear. And you heard back then, he was a god. He was at such elevated status. People going to the games with the glasses dressed up to him. He's, he's an almost mythic figure, even though he's still the active head coach of that team. So when he is fired by the institution that propped him up, that, that made him this guy, that, that seemed to defer to him in so many ways, that is exactly, for me, the affirmation I needed to say, look, I, this story looks bad to begin with. He's clearly, Jerry Sanders, he's clearly guilty if Penn State's throwing the God overboard. This isn't some middle manager in a company that you're, you know, a sacrificial lamb. You would never put Joe Paterno's head on a stake if it wasn't obvious. You're, that make, Jerry you're making my point. I, 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 I agree. And, and, and just on the God thing, the God thing is so important because it's the prism through which the media sees all this case. And I, I have a lot of uh, metaphors and analogies that I use to explain what really happened here. One of my favorite, because I do think it gives people a good understanding of how this went down, is to use the religion analogy with regard to the Catholic Church scandal. The news media, and I'm sure people like you, maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong, immediately saw this, this movie, if you will, and said, wait a minute, we've seen this before. Joe Paterno is the Pope. The administrators are the Cardinals covering this all up. Jerry Sandusky is a pedophile priest. The Penn State football fans are the Catholic parishioners looking the other way, afraid to indict their sacred institution of, of Penn State football. That all made sense to people, except it's bullshit. Okay, it, it's not true. It's, it is a prism through which people saw this because it was easy. It made no sense for a lot of reasons, one of which, by the way, is if Joe Paterno was so damn powerful, and I will agree, at times he absolutely was, how does a, a guy that powerful get fired uh, a week and a half after being the all-time winningest coach in the history of college football over a cell phone that gets delivered to his home by a carrier? Uh, how, 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 how is that? How is that superpower? I, how, how, I is that, it, how is that a god? Well, that's the point, though. It must have been so egregious. No. no the, the, I'm the, telling you that's where I landed. No, I'm, no, I'm I know. you in 2011. Right. And I'm telling you that the panic was so great. And the perfect storm, The fir one of the things uh, I'm going to say a lot is perfect storm. This whole story has a perfect storm of circumstances. One of them is... That Joe Paterno is old, and while the team is having a good year in 2011, and they had been better than they had been in the early 2000s when it was there was a lot of pressure for Joe to leave, that there had been a lot of resentment inside Penn State about how we're going to get rid of Joe Paterno, and specifically the vice chairman of the board of trustees, John Surma, 
who was very close to the governor, Tom Corbett at that time, saw this as an opportunity. Never let a crisis go to waste. And he saw this as the opportunity to get rid of Joe Paterno. That's, that's, pretty, and, cyn- that's pretty cynical. Uh, no, no. Even I'm calling you cynical. Everyone <laughs> close to this case uh, who uh, was involved, including Graham Spanier, believes that that's exactly what happened. They probably here. thought Sandusky was. No, no, I'm not. Saying, oh, no, no. Let me be clear. And yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because you also used the word conspiracy in your intro. And I don't. I know. I think you know me well enough to know I am an anti conspiracy theorist. I don't think human beings are nearly smart enough. Uh, or competent enough to pull off anything more than a two-person conspiracy. And and I am not alleging a massive conspiracy here. I am act I am alleging that a whole series of groups of people acted in their obvious self-interest in a way that created a perfect storm of circumstances that allowed and enabled this massive injustice to occur and to be clear, you said I'm I'm positive of it. It's not just that I'm positive of it. Once you get into the details, it's not even close. And I'm hardly the only person that has come to the same conclusion. In fact, almost everybody I know that has objectively looked at this in great detail has come to either my conclusion or they have couched their opinion politically like Malcolm Gladwell did in talking to strangers using much of my work including the, the, one of the key findings, which is that the date of the McQuarrie episode is still wrong after all these years in a way that totally fundamentally changes the entire story. But Chapter 5 of Talking to Strangers, Malcolm Gladwell's last best-selling book, reads like someone who is about to make the argument that Jerry Sandusky is innocent. He just doesn't have the guts to do it because he's got a lot to lose. He's Malcolm Gladwell. Ma- uh, Mark Pendergrast, a very re- well-respected author, written like 14, 15 books, He's written a book called The Most Hated Man in America. Again, you partially using my work. There's a chapter about me in that book where he concludes that Jerry Sandusky is almost certainly innocent. Uh, I mean, we have interviews in, the, in our podcast with the benefit of hindsight with Gary Schultz. Gary Schultz is one of the three Penn State administrators who got convicted of the alleged cover-up, yet he's now on the record in his first interview that he's ever done about this entire case. He did it with me for four hours. He now believes Jerry Sandusky is innocent. Two former members of the Penn State Board of Trustees, Bob Capretto and Al Lord, very well-respected people, titans of business, reputations to defend. These are not anything close to crackpots. They are on the record in interviews with me saying that they believe Jerry Sandusky is innocent. And it's not just a feeling. They they have had access to all the documents over the last 10 years that, it, that have transpired at Penn State. Bruce Heim, the founder and funder of the Second Mile Charity, has changed his position now. He did an interview with me saying Jerry Sandusky is, in fact, innocent. We've, we've got so many other people that have in the same boat. John Snedden, former NCIS agent, who investigated this case for the federal government because Graham Spaniard's a federal uh, uh, security clearance was up for renewal after the scandal hit. Snedden was brought in by the federal government. He interviewed more people in this case that were critical than Louis Free did for the Free Report. He concluded not only was there no cover-up, there was no crime. Hello, before you go to another tab, please like, subscribe, and follow for more clips and highlights. Good? Okay. See, beautiful. That's a natural at work.